food forests our path to infinite abundance. Learn why and how to co-create with nature to grow a food forest by Tutu Signs. That's me. Aloha and welcome to our path to infinite abundance. Mother Earth gives us everything we need to enjoy living here. She's the source of all materials, foods, medicines, and craft supplies. Nature has the best return on investment because life grows in expansive fractal patterns. Only nature's expansive growth can provide this phenomenal investment return. Food forests are unified communities of biodiverse living species. Each species performs specific functions and they all participate and help the whole community thrive. Together, the biodiverse unified communities sustain infinitely abundant and everlasting gardens. The cooperative communities demonstrate for us humans how we can learn to live as diverse people, but unified through our shared planet Earth. You can learn to step into nature's infinite abundance by co-creating with life energy to produce nutrient-dense, fresh foods, plant medicines, and craft supplies to harvest for free. Support the wildlife as you create a beautiful habitat and purify the environment. Learn to grow a food forest near you. What does forest mean? Forest can be a noun or a verb. The noun forest means a large area chiefly covered with trees and undergrowth. The verb forest means to plant with trees, to create a forested area. Forests include long lasting perennial plants and annual plants that live for only one year. And they grow to they grow food and create habitats for wildlife and humans. Forests clean the surrounding air by sequestering carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. They prevent erosion with their root networks. And they channel water into the soil by capturing water from rains and clouds and as it drips down the roots and into the soil. By growing food forests, people have fixed environmental problems, such as desertification or where things start turning into desert. You can reverse that with a food forest. Deforestation, obviously you can plant new forests. Water shortages and pollution from unchecked storm runoff. So in a forest, you'll notice something different. What is that difference? No humans are in there working. No one is planting new plants fertilizing, watering, plowing, tilling, spraying, or trying to control the wildlife. Wild forests grow the densest biomass on earth without any help from humans. Over time, food forests will naturalize and expand too. What is a food forest? Food forests are human created home gardens designed like wild forests because they produce because food forests grow diverse biota, they produce a wide variety of harvests year round. So food forests may be smaller than wild forests because they are gardens and food forests are different from regular forests because they grow what we choose to plant. Biota in nature fractally expands in infinitely reproducing patterns. So the word biota means the sum of all fauna, flora, and fungi, or all living beings in nature. So fauna are the animals. If you think of like a fawn as a deer, flora are the plants. You can think of flowers and fungi, fungus are the mushrooms. So biota is all of those. So that's a, a term that encompasses all living beings in nature. 
wild forests grow and expand for thousands of years because life forms or biota replicate as they grow. We tap into this ongoing creation of abundance by imitating nature. We create a forest, planting it with what we love to eat. Growing in a food forest are various nut and fruit trees among layers of veggies, herbs, berries, and edible roots to create long lasting abundant harvests from our yards. These powerful ecosystems provide nourishment for us humans and for the wild biota. Now food forest designs mimic forests by growing plants in vertical layers allowing them to grow more food than common one layer designs growing only horizontally. Thus food forests grow more food in the same space compared to monocrop farms. Now in this diagram, you can see the tallest trees are number one. They could be any useful trees such as date palms, nut trees, or timber trees. These tall trees protect the smaller trees the smaller fruiting trees and together they form the pillars and the canopy of the food forest. Shrubs fill in the shrub layers and then herbs, flowers and ground covers are the lowest layers. Some of these crops will be root crops that are growing underground and that's an underground layer too, as well as fungi or mushrooms fungi and water biota. So things that live in the water. So this is a diagram uh, by temperate climate permaculture that shows these nine layers of the edible forest garden. Now, this is one of my favorite parts. I love to recognize the potential power of seeds. Let's take a look at seeds which are a great example of nature's infinite abundance. Seeds we plant in our soil can grow into living biota with the potential to reproduce for generations, populating gardens and affecting our planet long past our lifetimes. A planted seed may even begin a forest that will last for the duration of planet Earth. Within each kernel exists not just one life form, but also the potential for that life form to continue producing new life forms for generations. So I showed you this picture of corn here. Uh, you may or may not understand that each one of these kernels of corn is actually also a seed that can plant that can be planted. You like dry it out, plant it and then it would become a new corn stalk and make a bunch more corn. So seeds are so persistent that many of the weeds we see in our gardens are descendants of plants that people of previous generations cultivated. Now the plants are still reproducing without any help from humans. Tiny seeds are easy to overlook or ignore. Sometimes they're just hard to see yet they're incredibly powerful, acting as secret agents with fantastic potential as they quietly grow and shape the world. Seeds move by human hands, by wind, water, by clinging to an animal's fur, or sometimes they get eaten by animals and eliminated in their droppings. Some seeds pop up, pop open, poop, and eject seeds into the area and some fall straight down onto the soil. So there are many ways that seeds, seeds can get around. So if they land in a suitable spot, they sprout their roots and leaves and a new plant is born. If not, they may lay dormant for many years before they reach a spot to grow. A well-placed seed will grow into an easily visible new plant life that will shape the world and eventually create, create many new generations that shape the world. The, this quiet unfoldment often goes unnoticed and receives no help from humans. These new seedlings seemingly sprang out of nothing, but we know they came from something. They came from seeds. 
annual plants take only one season to create their seeds to carry on the work in the next season. On the other hand, trees take years to grow their first fruits, but keep growing more fruits for decades, even hundreds of years. Although they produce many different life forms, we can't see the resources seeds have consumed to grow into plants. Amazingly, the resources they need to develop are available for free, sunlight, soil, air, and water, and they don't seem to use up the resources. There's abundance everywhere in the world of seeds, so don't underestimate the incredible power of seeds. So are you interested in a return on investment that approaches infinity? Since there's such fantastic abundance that comes from a seed well planted in soil, just for fun, let's take a break here and compare an investment of a dollar in the stock market to an investment of one seed in the soil. So in the stock market or the money economy, you would first purchase a share in the stock market for a dollar. We you would use your heart, our hearts and minds. We would use our hearts and minds to decide what to invest in. Then of course we have to pay a fee to create the transaction in the stock market. Now we obtained the dollar in the first place by performing some type of valuable work. Then we paid tax on the money we earned and this $1 is part of what we get to keep, what we have left over after our hard work and paying our taxes. If we keep our investment in the stock market for many years and with luck, we can expect to average a 6% return on investment. For example, invest a dollar and earn six cents in a year, ending the year with a dollar six. However, the national and state governments will tax the interest our money earned. So we will have less return on our investment. So we see, see, we see weak growth in the money markets. We have to keep working hard every day to get enough money to pay the next bill and then the next and the next. We become enslaved when we work for money. See, this kid's mad. <laughs> Cute. So in seeds or nature's economy, there's no fee involved for planting a seed. Instead, we use our hearts and minds to decide which seeds to plant and where to plant them, then use our hands to plant the seeds. We first obtain the seed either for free by finding one growing on a plant or purchasing one. But for comparison, we'll say we paid $1 for one seed. So if you plant one seed and in one season, like in, an, in the case of an annual plant, in one season of say six months or so, the plant yields one more seed, then you have a 100% return on your investment. If it yields 100 seeds, your investment return would be 10,000%. Or if the plant yields another 1,000 seeds, your investment return would be 100,000%. And this is common. Now, if you were to plant all of those seeds and many of them gave you the exact yield, you would be approaching infinity in a few years. So one seed then makes an infinite number of new seeds possible. We also control this process when we plant the seed at the right time and in a suitable location. If not, sometimes a seed will lay dormant for a long time. Then one day when the time is right, it grows. And then we get to keep all of our seeds and we can eat them if they're edible or plant them and get more plants and more seeds. We can make drinks with them or meals with them. We can sell them, share them, feed them to animals, make jewelry or art pieces with them. So once you plant them, seeds begin an unending chain of abundance. And soon you are overflowing with seeds. And I found this funny one with Gene Wilder. 
oh, you don't measure ROI. How's that working out for you? That's kind of cute. Okay, so here's the last slide in this section. Notice in the money-based economy, you work hard to gain a little, while in the seed-based economy, you work little to earn much. You can eat seeds and the fruits they produce, so they give you abundance and food and excellent health. But unfortunately, you can't eat money, so you have to find a way to trade it for food or medicine. One reason it's so fun to create a food forest is to participate in this abundance. Here's a romaine lettuce plant that matured in the food forest for a season. Then it grew these puffy white flowers. Inside of each of these flowers is about 10 to 20 seeds for new romaine lettuce plants. Three days before taking this picture, I had picked all of the seeds off this plant and counted them to calculate the ROI. And I planted those seeds around the food forest. Now this same lettuce plant had grown all of these brand new seeds within a few days after I had picked the first seeds. So this picture reminds me of nature's abundance. There's a whole new batch of seeds to be picked and planted. There are too many seeds to count and they all came from one seed which grew into one lettuce plant. And of course, when the lettuce plant was growing, we got to pick and enjoy the lettuce, and we still got the seeds. How is that for infinite abundance? So a food forest sustains and replicates itself. Nut trees like these pecans grow seeds in abundance year after year. The seeds are delicious to eat, and they will produce more trees. But imagine if every seed grew another tree then over time, we really would have lots of nuts. Another example is multiplication through roots. These banana stalks expand their roots by multiplication into the soil. And from the roots, up pop the new banana plants. Biodiversity creates strong communities. And I love this quote by Jeff Lawton, you can solve all the world's problems in a garden. So planting a considerable diversity of plants will keep the diverse populations closer to a healthy balance. A wide variety of thriving plants contribute to the community and create welcoming habitats for predators and prey. Ladybugs, ants, praying mantises, aphids, spiders, lizards, and birds coexist in the food forest, eating each other. Many plant, many plant eating insects can't fly or travel well, and the scents and colors of various plants distract them in many directions. In a food forest, they can't focus on breaking down a large area of the same plants as they can in a monocropped grow because of the diversity of all ages and stages of plants in the food forest. This method of growing our gardens eliminates the pest problem found in monocropped fields of one type of plant. A food forest fertilizes itself. Because of the cycle of life and death, plant parts, including leaves, flowers, stems, twigs, and branches, litter the forest floor. This fallen material forms the basis of the fertilizer for the living plants. So death and life are two sides of the same coin. Here's a picture of a pigeon pea plant growing in soil covered with mulch. So when plant materials fall to the ground, the decomposing forces of air, water, sunlight, and earth-dwelling biota begin breaking the debris into its simplest forms. This decomposed material is what I call authentic plant food because it provides the nutrients and components that plants need to grow healthy new growth. So we don't need to fertilize food forests. But here's a super interesting fun fact. Human urine provides the best known source of NPK fertilizer for free. What a perfectly designed system. So here's some food for thought. When you grow a food forest, 
you will have healthy food to eat without much work on your part. So local food forests are a great idea. We've tried having modern farmers grow food for everyone, but commercial farming methods and the practice of shipping produce worldwide pollute Mother Earth. As people, create world, as people worldwide create food forests, we can fend off the perils of toxicity and lack and bring on the joys of peace and abundance. So whether large or small, food forests make fabulous family home gardens because they grow various crops compactly together. Imagine your land producing food, wood, fragrances, medicine, homes for wildlife, dignified pleasant labor for exercise, and a peaceful coexistence with Mother Earth. Imagination is the bridge from the now to the divine possibility in your mind. We are part of an intelligent system and we will only thrive when we work in synergy with Mother Earth's dominant forces. So be a responsible and caring member of every community you belong to, including the global human family and Earth's e exquisite ecosystem. Forests can grow all over the planet. Food forests can grow all over the planet. Sepp Holzer is a famous permaculturist that grew all of his food for decades on a mountainous alp in Austria. Jeff Lawton, another famous permaculturist, and others have grown food forests in the deserts. Africans, Indians, and Asians grew forests around their homes. Anastasia, the beautiful forest hermit written about in the 1990s book series, The Ringing Cedars of Russia by Vladimir Megre, lived off what grew in the grew wild in the Taiga forest in Siberia, as did generations of her family. Jeff Lawton has also found another ancient food forest in, I think, Mon Morocco, that's thousands of years old. And anthropologists have discovered that the Amazon rainforest was once home to large impressive societies and the rainforest is largely a human artifact. Rather than planting fields of crops, these societies cultivated use, useful trees and plants which provided for them until some disaster destroyed their society. Their gardens continued growing without their help and eventually the food forest gardens hid the decimated settlements. And the term rainforest shows how forested areas can create sources of water, including rivers. Anywhere it grows, a food forest will perfect the dweller's land, expand fractally and live indefinitely. Here's an example of Regreening the Desert by Jeff Lawton. This is his before, this is in the Jordan Desert. Um, this demonstrates the possibility of growing food forests in the desert. Here's before and here's after. And there's a documentary film name, filmmaker named John D. Liu. And he documents large scale ecosystem restoration projects in China, Africa, South America, and the Middle East. And this is a movie he made called Regreening the Desert, highlighting the enormous benefits for people, wildlife, and the earth of undertaking these efforts. Where do we place the need for quality food, water, and air within our priorities in life? Today, they require top priority. Food forests can produce great food, clean air and water, and create a healthy environment for ourselves and wildlife. We can grow the food and water supplies around us and create freedom from the monocrop farming era. We can prepare to answer the questions. In times of crisis, what will you eat? Where will you get shelter and medicine? Where will you get clean water? We can get them all from food forests. We can work as individuals and communities to grow plenty of food everywhere. And I love this quote by Bill Mollison, though the problems of the world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. 
So here is content from my book two, The Eight Step Path to Creating a Food Forest. And step one is finding a piece of land. Step two, meet and greet the volunteers. Step three, plant nut and fruit trees. Step four, cover the soil. Step five, transform your forest floor. Step six, channel and save water. Step seven, protect plants from pests. And step eight, harvesting and annual cycles. So step one is to find a patch of land where you can plant your trees, shrubs, herbs, and seeds. It may be small or large. You may already have some land, whether it's alongside a sidewalk, the edge of a patio, a small side yard, or a large backyard, a slope, or an empty lot and you have a place to start. Woohoo! You can turn any piece of land into a food forest. You may find a community garden or grow a food forest at a friend's house. Once you have land, observe and take note of its sunny and shady areas, the directions of the prevailing wind, and view its topography in a satellite image. And you can take note of elevation changes places where it might, where water might settle or wind might blow. Then next, make a list of everything already growing and a list of everything that you would like to grow. Then begin to imagine and create plans for your food forest. Think about which tall trees and shorter trees you want to grow. Think about where you, where you can place them. You may want to create a living fence or dot them all over the land. Use your imagination and listen to your intuition and record all of your ideas. Remove all trash, junk, and litter. And be grateful while you work and it will become more fun than just more fun than work. It'll become more fun than work. Think of working in the garden as a substitute for gym workouts, and that will give you a positive attitude about expending energy by creating a food forest garden. So growing your food, growing your food where you can is one of the most important projects you can do. We benefit our families, health, wildlife, and the planet when we eat our locally grown food because it's fresh and nutrient dense, it tastes delicious. Okay, so step two, meet and greet your volunteers. Every weed has a purpose for growing. Find out everything you can about every plant you see using a plant identification app or Google. Learn about its qualities and uses. Some are edible, some are helpful to the soil, some are medicinal and some are useful for crafts or feeding wildlife. For example, the, saw, the sap from this non-toxic wild lettuce plant called Lactuca seriola relieves pain extremely well and grows freely from seed every spring. <clears throat> if I hadn't identified it, I would have thought it was a useless weed. Now I use it for all pain relief and share it with others in my community. It has soothed pain from teething, back aches, sciatica, sore knees, migraines. Amazing that this plant is here and freely growing as a volunteer. And this is not the only plant that I have discovered that has tremendous beneficial qualities. And here's a great quote from George Washington Carver. I wanted to know the name of every stone and flower and insect and bird and beast. I wanted to know where it got its color, where it got its life, but there was no one to tell me. So in this modern era, we are truly blessed and we have an extraordinary opportunity to be able to take a picture of a plant and then the internet can feed back information about that plant. And we can also go on other people's websites or videos and learn what they have learned about the plants. So we're sharing all this information around and it's becoming very freely available. And it's making us 
wealthier because now we know what we have growing already. So step three, plant nut and fruit trees. Nut and fruit trees form the pillars and the canopy of the food forest. Beautiful and durable, they protect their neighboring plants in hot or cold weather and quietly use their powerful ability to materialize food, oxygen, fuel, and handiwork supplies from the environment. Effortlessly, they keep all of Mother Earth's children fed, warm, and safe. The more you know about trees, the more reasons you are grateful for them. Here are six reasons to consider. Trees, along with the entire plant kingdom, make food for all life out of free sunlight, air, soil, and water. They make oxygenated air for us to breathe. They supply significant sources of energy, petroleum, natural gas, coal, and firewood. They supply valuable fibers and building materials. Trees moderate our soil and air temperatures and shelter us and the wildlife from storms. Trees replicate infinitely abundantly and can live for centuries. Here's a picture of uh, planting new trees in uh, our original orchard. This actually right here was, is an existing uh, pecan tree and uh, some of the neighbors taller trees around the sides there. But we are planting in some trees in this grassy field. So studies show no benefit to adding amendments to planting holes plant trees in the native soil and be sure the root crown is planted above ground so the tree can breathe. Step four, cover your soil with mulch. Multitudes of biota live above ground and below the surface in the soil and water. You can think of the underground community as a reflection of the above ground community. Tree roots grow downward, down toward the earth's core as tree limbs grow outward toward the sun and the soil surface is the zero point as above so below. Sometimes we see earthworms, insects, spiders and burrowing reptiles and rodents when they come up above the soil surface but there are also unseen creatures so tiny that a spoonful can hold billions of them. Mysterious little life forms called archaea, bacteria, actinomycetes, algae, protozoa, springtails, mites, nematodes, and fungi break down fallen organic matter into the simplest components so it can be recombi recombined again in a new living plant. Their activities and waste products create fertile soil that feeds and grows your food forest. So this is a beautiful picture that shows the as above, so below concept. And that you can imagine that there are many uh, biota forms living in the soil as well as above on top of the soil. And we are lucky we get to walk in the zero point between the two. And this is a picture of a pile of mulch that we probably had dropped off by a tree trimmer and it's basically chipped up trees with leaves and you can see we use shovels and buckets and wheelbarrows to scoop it up and place the mulch in different parts of the garden. So now please go to or you don't have to go right now, but you can go after this video. Please go to YouTube and enjoy this beautiful video, Back to Eden Film. This is the video that inspired me to cover our soil initially with mulch. And then you can get started covering your soil with wood chip mulches from tree trimmings. Oops, we don't want that. Okay. Transform your forest floor, step five. So back in step two, you learn to identify your volunteers and get to know their properties. You are now prepared to decide which volunteers you will keep in your food forest and which ones to replace with something better. 
most of the plants you will find growing on the floor of your land will produce flowers, which develop the seeds. Sometimes flowers become fruits and develop seeds within the fruits. And sometimes flowers produce seeds without creating any fruits. Eventually, those seeds will end up on the food forest floor where they await to become new versions of the plants that they once were and that they grew from. Once seeds lodge into the forest floor, they sense the right time to open by environmental cues, such as the season and the weather. And sometimes seeds can remain in the soil for decades before they sprout. That is why the volunteers from the past keep showing up in our gardens. So in this step five, transform your forest floor, we practice controlling the seeds that land on the floor. Here's a process that will transform your forest floor and save you a lot of effort in future seasons. Here are your action steps, food forester. You can move your plant, you can chop and drop a plant, or you can replace a plant. So let's talk about move. Some volunteers will be plants that you like, but they sprouted and grew somewhere you don't want them to grow. For instance, the seedlings of trees or of other valuable plants often appear in inappropriate places like close to the house or in a spot you have reserved for something else. You may want to move or transplant those volunteers to new locations in your food forest. And that is one of the action steps, move. The next action step is called chop and drop. Some volunteers will be plants you don't like and don't want in your food forest. These volunteers may get the chop and drop treatment. Turn them into mulch with a weed whacker or a mower. Do this before they produce seeds to prevent them from generating more, if you can. You can leave the roots in the ground to hold the soil in place while you're busy with other projects. Then in the future, you can replace them. Now, if you weed whack or mow them after they've already present, pro, produced seeds, it's best to, to uh, gather the seeds first, maybe clip off the seeds, save them in a bucket and put them in the green waste or in the fireplace so you don't spread the seeds around. Um, so that's why it's better if you can do it before they go to seed or do it soon after they start going to seed so there's not so much to gather before you chop and drop them. And then the third choice that you have with your plants is called, is called replace. And this is one of my favorite springtime activities. After a rain, while the soil is still moist, I pull up plants that I don't want, roots and all, and that leaves a little nice hole and a pocket of crumbly soil. Into this hole, I place seeds or a small plant. So I'm replacing an unwanted plant with a favorite plant. And this picture shows um, a part of our food forest floor, which was once a field of grass and weeds, the forest floor is being transformed to grow edible and useful plants, which naturalize themselves and become the native understory growing up through the mulch. Here we have onions, calendula, garlic, radishes, strawberries, and Cape gooseberry, also known as pojos or pineapple tomatillo, growing on the food forest floor. And now these are the plants that spread their seeds naturally and, and spread themselves around the forest floor instead of the old plants that were like grasses and weeds. So that's step five, transform your forest floor. Step six is channel and save water. Saving water underground is a primary objective because we want the big trees to tap into the water table. In addition, the ground can hold way more water than our rain barrel storage tanks. So it makes sense to store it where it belongs and where it will be available for plants to use underground. 
so here's one of many ways that we use to save water in the water table. We insert watering pipes in the ground in the tree, tree's root zone. These are two to three foot long pieces of ABS pipe or PVC if it's, if it's got a big enough diameter works too. And we install these at the time we plant the tree it, uh, is the best time to install them. Or if you have an existing tree, you can install them near the root zone of an existing older tree. So let's take a look at the water cycle here. So you have precipitation coming down from the sky, lands on the roof and on the concrete. It has surface runoff and it lands in the trees. It comes, the trees channel the water down into the water table. Now we try to catch the surface runoff if we can by little things like berms um, and swales and bushes can even ca catch the water. Like when they hit the leaves, the, the leaves will channel the water down into the water table. So if the groundwater gets too full, you'll see a pond visible on the surface. Um, but all the water that's available um, that's on the surface will eventually evaporate and condense. And it also water also can transpire from the leaves up into the clouds again. And there it forms enough, when enough water gets up into the clouds, it rains back down. So you can see it's a circular pattern and we are trying to catch water in the water table. Okay, that was step six. Moving on to step seven, protect plants from pests. Based on our perspective that all insects have a purpose in the garden, we understand that some exist to transform diseased and dying plants into food for the next generation. Plants that are not healthy or in distress send out signals that attract insects to come and break them down. Helping break down organic material is the insect's way of assisting the garden system. But as Paul Gauchi says in the Back to Eden film, his plants are too juicy for insects. They don't eat the leaves because they're looking for unhealthy plants to help. They're like paramedics of the garden. And other eco-agriculture experts agree, insects don't attack healthy plants. When you have radiantly alive soil, your plants will be mostly healthy and less attractive to destructive insects. So that being said, there may be times when you want to deal with insect troubles, um, and here are a few techniques. First off, planting diverse plants will keep the insect populations balanced. You can also spray homemade insect repellents, which you can find everywhere online, recipes how to make them out of hot peppers and various things. I found luck with rubbing an orange peel around the trunk of a tree to deter ants. Um, the, the orange part of it has that orange oil in it that apparently ants don't like. Um, and for animal troubles, you can use fencing or screens. You can get a dog or a cat to eat rodents. Uh, snakes will come in and eat rodents. We saw a king snake in our garden today, which is a great snake to have in the garden. It's eating all kinds of small creatures. And let coyotes into your garden too. They eat larger pests like bunnies and uh, squirrels and gophers and even grasshoppers. I have a video of a, a coyote grabbing a grasshopper out of the sky. Um, and you can also create an owl box to encourage owls to come into your garden. Um, so all those things are the ways that the populations balance themselves, except for the insect repellents and stuff. Okay, so populations do balance themselves out in a healthy garden. So live and let live when you can. 
Even scary spiders and snakes are doing an essential job of eating insects and becoming food for birds and lizards. So it's a complex system. We draw the line though, when creatures come inside our house, we escort them back outside. Step eight, sustainable harvesting and annual cycles. Here's how the annual cycle goes. First, it starts when you prune overgrowth to keep trees and bushes healthy and in shape or remove unwanted volunteer plants. You return those trimmings as to the forest floor as sheet mulch after passing them through a lawnmower or putting them through a wood chipper. Each year you sow new seeds and plant new plants at the best time for your climate. When the weather's hot and dry, you water as needed. Of course, you fertilize for free by adding new mulch whenever is needed to keep the soil covered up to one inch thick. Fortunately, free fertilizer flows from the garden and from us. Then you gather the harvests of foods and new seeds as they ripen and eat, cook, and preserve the abundance as you go. And you per, per, re-perform the first seven steps in the eight step path as needed. So here's what you'll be doing in each of the four seasons. Here are the annual cycles. In autumn, it's harvesting fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, etc., preserving them. It's chop and drop weeds or spent plants with a weed whacker prune is needed and in mild climates like ours here in Southern California, we plant new trees and bushes because that's the beginning of our rainy season and that's our best time to plant. Now that might not be the case with where you live. If you live in a snowy place, you, pro you probably plant in spring sometime, like maybe around May or something or April. Okay, in winter, you prune deciduous trees while their limbs are bare of leaves. You plant garlic, onion, lettuce, and other winter seed crops under bare trees or elsewhere in the food forest floor, depending on your climate, whatever your climate permits. In spring, you're going to replace those pop-up volunteers we call weeds with seeds. You're going to broadcast seeds onto the forest floor during rains or you can start seeds in small pots to get them established before planting them out. You're gonna plant new trees and bushes and harvest your ripe produce. And then in summer, water plants as needed, harvest, chop and drop, maintain mulch at one inch thick, prune and fertilize. So I like this old Greek proverb too, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will, shall never sit in. That's planting trees for the future, for the next generations. So in conclusion, food forests make fabulous family home gardens because they produce a vast variety of produce growing compactly together. You don't have to have much space to grow various crops and the wild biota do most of the work. So imagine your land producing food, wood, fragrances, medicines, homes for wildlife, and dignified pleasant labor for exercise and a peaceful coexistence with mother earth or mother nature. Food forest cinnamon synonyms include agroforestry, sustainable permaculture, biodynamic gardens, biodiversity, and regenerative ag agriculture. I use the name food forest, but I also really like the terms Garden of Eden and Garden of Infinite Abundance and Family Homestead. So people worldwide still grow food forests as they have done for eons. This ancient practice is our heritage and our sustainable future. Growing food forests at home, benefits our planet's environment. Food forest growing solves so many problems and it can be scaled to fit a container garden, a small patio, a large backyard, or up to large acreage. 
Even modern farmers can grow diverse crops using food forest methods. I give you this food for thought. When you grow a food forest, you will have healthy food to eat without much work on your part. And you'll leave a legacy of healthy food and a healthy mother Gaia for generations to come. So my name is Tutu Signs and I'm a food forest co-creator in Vista, California. Observing and learning from the garden, I shape and create a space of love for plants, animals, and people to thrive. Sharing my food forest life, work, and ideas helps others learn to grow food harmoniously with all life. My vision is to see a healthy planet Earth, its lands covered in food forests. I share the inspiring food forest teachings far and wide, hoping everyone will take the opportunity to experience wealth, health, and a, an abundance of food, medicine, and material supplies from the earth. Cheers to the food forest you will grow, the freedom you will achieve, and the health and wealth in infinite abundance you will experience. May all the world grow in abundant food forests and all the people live with love, light, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, and aloha. Let's sing and dance and laugh and rejoice for countless generations to come as we live surrounded by infinite abundance and unity among life. So you can learn more about Aloha Food Forest in Vista at our website, alohafoodforest.com. You can get copies of books one and two on Amazon. You can search Tutu Signs on Amazon or on Google. And if you're ready to become a certified food forester, you can enroll in the online school, Food Forest University, to learn how to grow a food forest. And if you successfully pass the course, you can receive, a, you will receive a certificate of completion certifying you as a food forester. And here are some acknowledgements. Uh, here are some of my favorite permaculture and food forestry teachers. And I thank you to all these teachers and others that I may not have listed. There's Jeff Lawton, Paul Gauchi, Ernst Goch, Paul Wheaton, Masanobu Fukuoka, David the Good, various YouTubers, Anastasia and the Ringing Cedars of Russia, my grandma Lula, who gardened her whole life and fed hungry people from her garden during the depression. Also our creator, the great spirit and many wisdom teachers from the past and present. And best of all, from mother nature herself. I send aloha and best wishes to all food forestry students and food, future food foresters. Thank you for watching this presentation.